Welcome back to the Paddle and Fin Podcast Network. We're brought to you by Pelican Built Tough. For all situations, go to pelican.com. Yak Gadget. For all your fine kayak fishing accessory needs, go to yakgadget.com. Eastport Marina on the beautiful shores of Dale Hollow Lake. For all your lodging, kayaking, and fishing needs, go to eastport.info. Now let's get this show started. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Bass Thumbs Fishing Channel, our Bass Thumbs Fishing Podcast, where we are constantly trying to keep our thumbs ripped up. Tonight, uh, we got Mr. Dominic Doan back with us tonight. He won a local event with the Urban Anglers Club. We're going to hear about his successful day out there on the water this past weekend, along with Mr. Brian Lepke. Brian won the SoCal Kayak Anglers event down at San Vicente on this last Saturday and caught like 91 inches and had a phenomenal day out there. And we're going to go ahead and hear about his successful day as well. Uh, but first things first, as always, we got a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we got the Delta this weekend for Yakabass. Yakabass is going to be up at the Delta this coming weekend. Um, I believe they're launching at a Paradise Point, so it's going to be pretty cool to see um, who comes on top of the Yakabass event out there. I know Greg Blanchard, uh, all the guys are going to be out there this weekend, so good luck to everyone that's fishing the Delta this weekend. The Delta is a phenomenal place to fish, and I wish I was there, but I'm unfortunately not able to make it, but... Uh, good luck to you guys. Um, also, uh, I know that I've been seeing some things. I don't know too much about it, but the Wild West Kayak Pro Tour is going to be starting this weekend. So best of luck to all the anglers that are going to be fishing that event. Then we got uh, June 5th, I believe, is the California Bass Nation Kayak Series at Lake Comanche. So if you guys are looking to qualify for their state championship and get a shot at the big Bassmaster Kayak Championship, nationwide uh make sure you guys try to head out to comanche on june 5th to qualify for that event um, it's a qualifying event for their state championship so uh yeah it's gonna it should be a good bite um unfortunately i was planning on trying to make it but my brother-in-law is getting married in june and they picked june 5th and 6th for the bachelor party so i will not be able to make it but uh um look i was looking forward to it but best of luck to everyone that goes and if you guys haven't signed up yet make sure you guys go check that out uh, let's see what else we got the ABA working man series going on right now. And it is very awesome to kind of see this kind of new cutting edge event, um, happening right now. I believe this is going to be our third weekend this weekend, and it's pretty fun to kind of follow along. Uh, they can only fish Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at designated lakes throughout the whole Western region. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and shout out the guys that are leading really quick. So let me pull this up. Over here on Fishing Chaos, um, the Working Man series is going to be on Fishing Chaos. And the coolest part about this Working Man series is that there's only going to be two, basically two months of events. So the winners from this event this month, there's going to be five different winners. And those five winners are going to qualify for their 10-person championship that is going to be happening at the end of the year at Lake Havasu. And the prize the, the package that's going to go along with being at the championship is almost going to be like a 10 house feel where there's going to anglers are going to be receiving these huge prize packages when they get to the casino, the casino um, overnight stay and all the stays are going to be comped. Uh, I, I know food's going to be comped. There's going to be like a two day championship and they're going to be fishing for like $15,000 in cash and prizes. And there's only going to be 10 anglers competing. So that's going to be extremely fun to cover and watch. I'm hoping I can qualify. I'm going to sign up and compete in it next month, but it's going to be tough because, you know, the guys dedicate their whole weekend to it and they get on those fish and there are some big limits already. And let's see. So we got um, the working man series. Let's see who's leading in each region so far. So in Arizona, we got Charles Booth leading with 80 and a half inches with Bryce Gibbs close behind with 76. The Colorado River region, we got Kent Stoker with 95 and a quarter and then Ben Risty, Ristai with 93 and a quarter and then we got lance angle with 91 and a quarter so that's going to be a pretty tight region uh, best of luck to you guys out there and kent is in the lead and then we got the norcal region so cali's coming in with uh, bob zang up north with a hundred and a half inches already uh, i know bob's in a few different monthlies right now and in the other monthlies where he can fish every day he's got like 105 inches so bob is definitely on a big bite this month so 
uh good good luck bob and and keep going we got justin dutcher right behind him with 97 and a quarter and then pu yang with 94 and a half then we got the socal region we got uh anthony garcia with 101 inches leading the way then we got brian lepke who's with us tonight with 93.75 and then jason mathiat with 91 so california definitely throwing up double digits already and it's only halfway through the month which is pretty crazy but pretty typical with our with our big big fish out here um we got the utah region we got tyler i want to say ivy sorry if i butcher your guys' names i apologize but we got tyler ivy with 97 and a quarter or 87 and a quarter sorry about that and then chris spencer with 82.5 and cody henley with 73 and then uh yeah so that's that's pretty much the five different regions with uh the like the top three guys from each region so far best of luck to you guys fishing that and it's going to be really fun to watch it i'm going to be covering the event so um i'm just looking forward to the end of the month we'll have all the winners on from the regions and we'll find out where and how they caught them towards the end of the month let's see what else we got the aba kayak series coming out to lower otai in on june 25th and 26th i'm going to be promoting that event pretty hard uh, we also have a kbf trail that same weekend so it's going to be another big weekend, just like San Vicente was, where someone's going to be able to walk away with close to $10,000. I know Dominic shared that he won close to 7000 or right at 7000 at San Vicente. And man, I mean, he was honestly a couple inches away from sweeping the whole thing and could have walked away with that 10000 mark, which is crazy given the fact that we had around 40 anglers. So we got you know, 40, 50, 60 anglers, you know, hopefully we get that 60 mark or more and that prize money will continue to go up. But to have that kind of opportunity right here in our backyard in SoCal is, is huge. And I really encourage you guys that are listening that are kind of on the fence with maybe signing up for KBF. I know next year, Chad has been very public about this, but next year there's going to be a little bit of a drawback on how many trails we get. So if we could take full advantage this year and show out to, to lower Otai and show that we could put up those big numbers, um, like hopefully like 75, 80 would be awesome. And I know that we have the anglers out here and it would be awesome if you guys could come join us that weekend, um, you know, get into both, get into one on Saturday or one on Sunday, whatever, whatever you guys can do, but to show up and just sign up for at least one of the events happening that weekend would be incredible. And it would show a lot of support and, um, you know, that we want to have more trails like that out here. So we don't lose that opportunity. And then if we lose the opportunity, then we're going to have to travel really far for those big national events. And that's, you know, it's kind of tough, but let's try to keep those in our backyard while we have them. Uh, other than that, kind of something new with me, I'm going to be transitioning here soon to a, not a new kayak, but the SS 127. Uh, I'm going to be releasing a video on why I'm getting out of my P 127 for now and going back into the SS for now. Um, basically, when I had rigged that boat out, I tried to balance it the best I could. But when I get into some heavy water and some, you know, some big water and the waves and crashing in, that boat, unfortunately, with the way that I have it rigged out and it's balanced the best that I could, it just does not want to drain, which is unfortunate because I really like the platform. I love going like 4.8 miles an hour in that thing. But I can't have in the back of my mind, like, Oh, I, I don't want to travel too far or go, you know, across the lake when it's not, when it's not the best conditions because my boat might not drain out on the, you know, the scupper plug. So it's unfortunate, but, um, that's what's going to be happening here in the next month or so. So, um, I'll go ahead and release a video and, and a walkthrough and kind of discuss that when, when it comes, but, um, that's pretty much it. The next thing that I'm going to be fishing is the lower Otai event at the end of June. So I'm preparing for that. I went out recently. I went out actually yesterday to kind of go check it out and didn't have the best day. Uh, the water level is pretty low. The, the water temperature is about 75 degrees. There's a ton of fry fish or guarding fry, but they're just kind of in kind of like that little bit of trans weird transition from post spawn to kind of reaching that summer water temp and summer pattern. So, um, yeah, we'll see how that one goes. We'll see. Hopefully the grass continues to grow and it, and it gets back to that froggy punch chatterbait bite that we had last year. But anyways, guys, without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring these guys on and we're going to hear, um, how their weekend went last weekend. So let's go ahead and bring on a uh, double digit angler, Dominic Doan. What up, Dom? And then we got, what up, what up, what up, what up, what up? what's going on guys? What's up? 
What's up, Ryan? Good Going. to see you guys. <laughs> well, uh, I know yeah, that you thanks guys for both, having me. Yeah, you guys both had a great weekend last weekend. Uh, so, like I said, Brian fished the SoCal event on Saturday, and then Dominic fished that event as well. And then he also fished the Urban Angler Club on Sunday and took first place out there. So, um, you guys have both been on the show before. People that listen to the show, you know, know your names. They they know, you know, how you guys got into fishing and all that. So we're not going to go there tonight. We're going to go kind of straight into your guys' event. So let's start with Brian since Brian was on Saturday. Um, and Dom will hear a little bit from you too, but about Saturday. Brian, how was the deal, man? Was it was it the same? Did you kind of run the same stuff that you ran when we were at the when we were there for the ABA or or what was your what was your deal? I pretty much run the same pattern every time I'm at San Vicente. Sometimes the fish are there. Sometimes they're not. Um, usually when I have to go look for something there different, it doesn't work out. Uh, so luckily my fish were there in the spots that I used to catch them at. And uh, the size, there was a certain area where the size was better than everywhere else. So yeah, um, so- it was pretty, pretty finessey though. I know that you like to, uh, I guess, like power shot a lot. Like I know you kind of go th- like thicker line when you drop shot and stuff. Do you take that same approach at San Vicente, or do you drop your line size and get really finessey there? Um, <clears throat> if I can, if if the water's got some color to it, I will fish. You know, ten, twelve pound test. But Saturday I was fishing seven pound test for the most part, and uh, setting the hook and just, you know, wishing for some luck on my side and it worked out so so were you were you drop shotting no i was throwing a thin senko just fly line okay Okay. yeah just uh, a little pockets here and there yeah weightless green pumpkin five inch thin senko um just anywhere that i thought of like a post-spawn female would be resting you know because i thought there was a lot of males guarding fry um I didn't see any females out, so I thought they might be tucked away, and they were. I know that thin Senko game is a very, especially weightless, that's a patient game. So you got to have a lot of patience to be throwing that for most of the day. But, I mean, obviously when you're getting bit, it's uh, not – you could be patient, but. <laughs> I mean, the fish were go, shallow. They were like less than five feet of water. So it, it wasn't you go through a bad. lot of bags? How many bags did you go through? Of Senkos? Yeah. Uh, uh three three wow dang wait that's a I good problem caught, to have. i mean go ahead i probably caught 35 40 fish that day no way yeah wow all in the thin senko every single one should have hit me remember up. what i told you remember <laughs> what i told you dom about brian when he said when he says that i know for a fact there was some other baits though <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can had, believe whatever you I, want. <laughs> I think he he had a toxic bait tied on though. Did you catch any on that? That that I don't uh... I don't have any. No, it was a it was a um, bass brains wake bait. Yeah, did you did you land anything on that or no? No, I tried oh, okay. it in the morning. I didn't get anything. Oh, okay. There was too Brian's much grass to kind fish of, it Brian, tight to shore. Brian is one hundred percent the kind of person when I used to play poker. I would literally call every single time just to see if he's just see if he's bluffing. <laughs> I mean, I, I got Brad coming up to me, showing me pictures of my fish from like months ago, saying, "What's that? What kind of worm is that?" He's like, "You told me you're using this." I'm like, "I'm like, how much time do you have on your hands, dude? To look at my pictures like that." <laughs> no, dude, Brad, Brad, we we joke about it all the time, but he definitely zooms in on every crevice of everyone's dirty x photo bro he (laughs) finds the most random stuff dude it's pretty funny i'm not gonna lie he did that at the delta too yeah he was he was zooming in all the time on on the delta hey we should start per we should start messing with him and just see if he catches on to it and just like put like an eight inch hut at the floor of our deck every single time What were you gonna say, you Brian? What, you're you're talking about the you're talking about the drop shot. That that's something I used to really rely on. Like, I mean, that was I'd fish that all the time. I I think the fish are getting pretty conditioned to a drop shot these days, though. I mean, mm. uh, occasionally you'll catch a big one now, but I mean, 
sometimes you can't even get bit on it, especially with live scope. I can see him swim up to it, swim away. You know what I mean? So yeah, I mean that's why. I mean, <clears throat> I know that there's kind of a lot of guys that throw six pound, but I throw six pound, and I might even consider even throwing four pound here pretty soon because I think I can still catch him on four pound. Dude, when no, I first no, started dude, fishing, <laughs> when I first started bass fishing from saltwater, I'd go to Diamond Valley all the time and rent a boat. And they were always like, oh, you got to use four pound, four pound. You know how many Dude, I, I giant, hear it a lot, giant double digit fish I lost because of that? Yeah, I wouldn't no, go for four sure. pound. I wouldn't go but if you go pound. ten, if you go 10 pound braid, because you got to you gotta drop your diameter of your braid when you tie that FG knot or whatever connection knot. Because if you tie like I think a, if you I think if you're going four pound, you got to go straight floral or mono. I don't you think, think you can fish. Yeah, braid. yeah. Because yeah. there's no stretch and the the braid's gonna snap. Dude, it. you can't even tie. You can't even tie a four pound fluorocarbon to braid. It'll I snap every single time. Ten pound though. Ten pound braid. I don't know. You could, Do you know but... Jacob Willer actually uses eight pound nano braid on eight pound floral. Like he doesn't even use uh, like twenty five pound braid at all. I've used so. eight pound braid quite a bit. The the yeah. only thing I don't like about it is it gets it gets wind knots really easy. Oh, because it's so thin. Yeah. So it's interesting because I mean that's why I throw six pound a lot is because I think I get more bites and I think I think it does a little mm -hmm. bit better action to the worm. But I'm gonna start trying four pound, especially on practice days. I'm gonna start trying four pound with ten pound braid, and I'll I'll kind of see how it goes. Because how, I mean, how you, often you... do you really how often do you really catch like that like honestly like that six and a half seven pounder? And even on a seven pounder, you can still land it on four pound test. Like you're talking about double digits, that's a different world. But like, let's just say five to let's just say five to like that seven pound bass, you could still land on four pound tests, especially if your jags right. Yeah, if, if you're an open if you're in open water and yeah, you gotta assume that there's no there's no nicks on your line and all your knots are perfect. And, yeah, and there's no quagga. You know, if there's quagga or trees, forget it. Or if there's docks, forget it. Like, don't do well, it. Well, I had six pound tests the whole time at Sandy. Hey, Peter. you can you can fish you can fish four pound, dude. I think you should fish four pound of Ote for sure. Six pound, like I will in freezing. the offshore rock piles. There's there's nothing around those rocks. Yeah, but they'll dig into those rocks, man. They know how to dig in those. Yeah, but those rocks, rocks, at, rocks those there. rocks at Otai are round. And you want to know how I know so that? <laughs> No, they're not. They're not jagged. They're super round. And you want to know how I know that? You can literally see them right now. That's how low the lake is. Mm. All right. Well, those you offshore throw your rocks in between. Test. In between are the entrance of Harvey's arm. Those I was offshore rocks. Mm. You could literally see the tops of them from from the water, from the top of the water. I was there Sunday. You were? Did you do yeah. well? I did okay. I wouldn't say well. Yeah, it was tough I, I, for me. 80, I mean, I was only 80, out there for four hours, but it was it was pretty tough. I wasn't feeling it. I'll tell you this much: I didn't, get one, I didn't get one single frog blow up the whole day. What about shad? Like, did you guys see any shad out there or no? Fry for days. Oh, really? Tons of bait. Tons of bait. Tons of bait. Yeah. Really. There's always tons a lot of bait, bait where the middle. where the bait always is. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about in the middle? Like the channel, the the arms. Are they blowing like, on them yeah, by the on dam. bait yet? <laughs> right by the dam. Are they blowing up? Are they blowing up on bait yet or no? Uh, yeah, they they blow up on bait there all the time, bro. There's always top water blow ups there. Oh, I see. Out in the middle of nowhere too. They're always chasing them. Right on. I need to get gonna, out there. We're gonna see Dom running around there out deep, of course, running around yeah. chasing them. I don't know. Well, I don't. I don't think that was a good idea over at uh, San Vicente. That's why Brian won. I feel like he he didn't go skip out on shallow water. I did, and that's what. That's why. I if I have six. the option to not look at fish on live scope, I yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah, it's just if hard though. Run bank and hey, you know what's funny? You know what's funny about this yeah. right right now? You know what's funny about this right now, Brian? Before San V this weekend. I was talking to Dom and he goes, dude, the shallow game is overrated, bro. I'm never going shallow ever again. <laughs> <laughs> There's no big fish up shallow. <laughs> and now he's sitting here saying, yep, should have went shallow. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, no. Like, 
I really do it's feel like changing. they get less pressure though. For sure. The deeper the water, you know, everybody's hitting the bank. That's that's why I don't have as much confidence on the bank than I do on the deeper water, just because everybody's hitting it, and we're in SoCal, you know, um, and these these waters fish small. But I mean, there are times like like Brian hit up hit up the island, hit up shallow water, and he he was on the right pattern. So definitely, I was over at the Delta skipping sinkles all the way back there in shallow water, not using you know, live scope. So you know what I've noticed recently good. when you when you get too I guess locked in on one thing, yeah, that's, that's when you start to get hurt a little bit. Like you got to be so yeah. open minded out here. Especially out here because the patterns are changing like daily. Yeah, that's true. They change. They change hourly. Yeah. You gotta adapt. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But hey, that culvert though is still held to some big fishing. <laughs> Dude, that was pretty funny. I'm not gonna lie. When I saw that, when I saw that in your video, I was like, man, that's that's pretty that's pretty good. I Dude, mean, first cast. Yeah, I first mean. Cast. I don't know what it was about that spot, but and still, like you still caught you caught your big one there, like. Yeah. It's, it's that fence. Know. They suspend on that fence. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. under the fence, there's a six foot concrete wall. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how far deep it goes down too. It doesn't just stop where you see it stop in the water. It goes down all the way to the bottom, like all the way down there, and then runs towards the dam a little bit. Did you notice that, Dom? Yeah, it extends out. Yeah. There's like these long concrete towers that go all the way down. And like Brian says, they're suspended on the very tops of those. And but then hey, there's you, big ones that spin on suspend on the yeah. bottom too. If you think about like this, if you think about this, you guys could you guys could say something too about this. That's probably the only concrete wall in any of our lakes. Besides the dam, you mean? <laughs> Beside well, Besides the dam, I mean but that's kind of like rip rap. Yeah, there's not even really a dam that that's like that. Really. That you can I'm fish. talking like a yeah. hard concrete wall. That's probably the only wall in all of our lakes down here. I'm Barrett. trying to think. Barrett has a wall. Oh, Barrett Dam. We don't even talk about Barrett. That's that's <laughs> cheating. I'll be there Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not. I'm not gonna fish the working man suit. I'm not fishing anymore, like this month for the weekend. So. Too busy. So I'm taking I'm a break on forfeit. The I'm I'm forfeiting. <laughs> he's he's experiencing the the month long uh, anxiety. Yeah, I could sometimes, probably only do it winter time. You know. Go ahead, Brian. What are you gonna say? Sometimes it just gets too much. I, I mean, we went from yeah. having. I said sometimes it it does get too much. I mean, uh, you know, we went from having like SoCal kayak anglers to having something every weekend that you can do you know what i mean and it's like sometimes i feel like i have to do it not necessarily that i want to do it but um i don't know it's it's still fun it's just so hold that sometimes hold that it's overwhelming thought. hold that hold that thought really quick we'll get into that let's talk about this actually let's shout out uh the top five really quick so this is the top five from top the six tournament top six. <laughs> you could barely see dom down there in six but Brian had 91, uh, Russell had 86.75, Justin 86 and a quarter, Mark Chrisman 94.75, and Jason with 84 and a half. Um, let's go ahead and bring up. Uh, so, congrats to the top five out there. There's 56 guys, I think, 56 anglers, um, which is a super good turnout. SoCal's throwing up the numbers this year for sure. And we got Mark Christian with the big fish, which was, I think, a, what was that, a 22.75, Brian? Look like it. Yeah. Uh, 22 and, 22 and a half. half. Yeah, 22 and a half, which is a giant. So, Mark, yeah. dude, nice fish, man. Solid fish. And then, Mark Brian, let's talk about this fish, ones. bro. Let's talk about this fish, dude. How, how, did, uh, how did this one come about? That's a tank. Um, that was on the on a little rocky point around the island. Uh, there was a little shade pocket with some grass right next to it. And it was like one of the most bassy looking spots I've ever seen. Uh, I just threw a thin Senko in there and didn't even feel the bite. Didn't even see my line jump, just picked it up and thought I was on a tree for a second. And then it, it came up with its mouth open and I, uh, just, I kind of muscled it in on seven pound test 
Because if I didn't muscle it in, it was going straight to a tree. So it was one or the other. So I just dude, isn't it? Isn't it the best? Like it. I know a lot of people talk talk about like throwing a sinko or whatever, but like, dude, there there's something about like when you're when you're working your sinko and then all of a sudden you just don't feel anything and you're like, okay, <laughs> and it, like that feeling of not feeling anything feels so good and then you set the hook and it just your rod just bends over and it's like, dude. There's something about that, dude. Like it's a, it's such a different bite. Like it's hard to explain because sometimes they jump the line, but that that bite where it's like you don't feel anything, and then your line's like all the way right, and you're just like, yes, it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, I, I like yeah. I like when you I like when you see the line jump, and you know oh, you yeah. got you know you got time because they're not gonna they're yeah. not gonna spit it out. Yeah, and you just you know you're gonna get a sweet hook set on it, and uh... yeah, I think the second best feeling is when you see the mouth come up on top of the surface, and you're just like, oh my gosh, that's a big in, that's yeah, a straight sure. big in, yeah. that's a double digit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I always think they're bigger. Than I just they wish. When they come I wish. Up. I wish Hodges was a player for this. Oh, I wish yeah. Hodges was still a player for the working man's. Mm. Hodges is closed though, right? Not yet. What? Are you serious? Yeah, I think it's open. Yeah, they they say they're gonna close like it, but they weeks. they it's still open. Oh. Do you see Johnny's ten pounder he got? Yeah, I saw. It, yeah. Giant. Did you see his? Did you see his scream? Did you hear I his scream? So. Uh-huh. I watched the video. It was like the most. Was awkward. it like? It was like the most awkward. <laughs> no, it was like you could tell he was genuinely excited because yeah. it yeah. was a super awkward little like yell. Yeah, it was he cool. doesn't get was too funny. excited. He's not really like an exciteful guy. He yeah. just does his thing, yeah. catches ten pounders. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he or yeah, Hodges is awesome. I I feel like I hope I hope when they do whatever they do to the dam or whatever they do to close it. I hope that they uh, put fill it back up all the way up, bro. That would just be insane if they did that, but I doubt it. But I hope they revive that lake because it's incredible. That Sorry to interrupt. Did that, that fluorocarbon line that you're using, Brian, seven-pound test, have you broken off at any of the fish? Uh due to like any last minute dives and like which brand are you using? Hold on. You guys are cutting out a little bit. What was it? I said, uh, what brand are you using for fluorocarbon line? And did you have any break off problems for like last minute well, dives? Well, I used to use Sunline sniper pretty much exclusively uh, until one tournament I had an Otai. And I had like four break off in a row. So after that, I switched to P-Line Tactical. And uh, mm-hmm. I've never broken a fish off with P-Line Tactical. And you're like so cinching that drag down, right? You're cinching the drag down with that seven-pound test? I don't, think I, I don't think I back the drag off enough. Um, I use a fairly soft rod. I use a like a whip snake, a Mega Bass whip snake, Orochi. So it's got mm-hmm. it, it bends pretty much the whole rod bend, so that's kind of okay. what I count on. Okay. Cool. Man, why? I mean, I I I throw six I throw six pound Seaguar Tatsu, and I could probably mm-hmm. count the number of fish on one hand that I've broke off, and I don't even think it was like probably even less than like five that I've ever broke off, and I mean, I I truly believe in that tattoo i know it's a little more expensive but it, it's been insane i've caught so many fish on six pound i mean when six i went to clear lake, yeah when i went to sick when i went to clear like that like a few couple augusts ago and i was fishing those volcanic rock piles i was throwing six pound the whole time landed them all in six pound got so. six pound tatsu and seven pound tactical That's yeah cool. all right right on it's a good tip all right well uh let's go ahead no, and transition. i still use i still use seven pounds 
I still use seven pound sniper, but oh, for the Senkos. Yeah, that's the only thing I use the sniper for. I think I just honestly, okay. I think I had a bad spool that one time. And, oh, uh, I see. Like I literally, I was there were like 19, 18, 19 inch fish, and they would jump, and the line would snap, like four in a row. It was, wow, it was no good. That sucks, man. I think I remember that day, Brian. And it was eight pound. It wasn't. Yeah. Wait, was, are you I'm talking about the? Are you talking about the same tournament you won, Shane? I think so. No, this think... this was the year before. Oh, okay. Freaking oh, okay. Shane, I think well, I for a while, that. For a while, for no, for a while there, like every time I'd see Brian after a tournament, he's like, "Dude, I broke off like two big ones." And I'm just like, "Bro, <laughs> you gotta stop yeah. breaking off on fish." Yeah, I was on a. I lost a lot of big fish one year. I think was it, I don't know if it was last year or the year before. I don't know what it was. Yeah. Yeah, you took a lot of second place finishes last year, I remember. You're always like I had second, 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 pl- second, second. Yeah. yeah was it due to like all those places. breakoffs? Was it due to all those breakoffs? Could yeah, you would, some of can them you were. confidently say? Oh, I mean damn. I mean, not not all of them. I mean, I know there was two for sure that I would have won if I wouldn't have broken the fish up. The other the other ones were just, you know, I just came up short. So, I wouldn't that just mind goes taking second place every time. I mean, yeah, once you get once you it's once you get like over three or four second place finishes, you want to taste the victory at least once, you know, <laughs> once a year. The Delta one hurt though. <laughs> yeah, Delta one hurt too. Yeah. I mean, the trolling motor cut off the line for on on mine. I was fishing oh, kind really? of like Cody Henley. Yeah, I was fishing like Cody Henley. I had it turned up like going two, two and a half miles per hour. And I was just chucking a chatterbait, just burning it back to the boat. I believe it was a 16 incher. And if I would have caught that 16, that, that just came off at the trolling motor on the shaft. I mean, I think I would have won because I, I, I was like less than an inch. It just just goes to tell you. Like in order to win one of these tournaments, you have to have everything going right for you, pretty much. Well, I mean, everything. Th- think of how small the scale is. We are like you see dudes on like Bassmaster in the Classic, they lose a fish that would have won in the Classic. You know what I mean? Imagine yeah, what that yeah. feels like. Oh, that's yeah. how I feel every time I lose a fish, though. Like I'm fishing the Classic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. uh Let's go ahead and transition over to Dom's uh, victory with the Urban Angler Club. Dom, I I have never fished the Urban Angler Club. Um, I really want to get out there and fish one of the Pudding mm-hmm. Stone events. Brian, I believe you've fished their events, haven't you? Have you fished Urban Angler Club before? Brian? Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Brian? Oh, sorry. My, my stream's kind of lagging. Oh really? What was that? Have you fished? If you have you want to try to hop back angle? out, if you want to hop out and hop back in, you can try that if you want to. But have you ever fished the Urban Angler Club? I fish all their saltwater spotted bay bass events. I've never oh, okay. fished one of their freshwater ones. So Dom, tell everyone what the Very Urban cool. Angler Club's about. Tell tell them about Kirk and how did your tournament go? Well, I wouldn't. I mean, I just joined last year, so. Um, I don't know too much about them, but all I know is a great group of, uh, fishermen, whether you're fishing from the bank, a uh, kayak, a tube or anything less than 14 feet. Uh, it's a great, I'd say it's a great experience. So if you're trying to get into competitive bass fishing and you want to see where you stack up against all kinds of levels, then join that club. And, uh, Kirk is the one, Kirk Matoyor, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, runs the events, and he's great. He's super friendly, and like I said, there's there's top-notch sticks in that club that, that you're going against as well. So you could really either stay warmed up for the bigger events in that club or really test how competitive you are against, like, 
the seasonal sticks. For instance, like Gilbert Garcia, Anthony Garcia, um, and I believe Alex Cox, and maybe John DeMonet fishes those that club as well. Yeah. Um, the, another thing that I like that they do is that they hit Paris a lot. They hit Pudding Stone. They hit right. the Lagoon or Lake X. Uh, mm -hmm. They fish uh, like all those Santa Fe Dam. Um, yeah. I still don't believe that there's fish in the Santa Fe Dam. I think that they catch them somewhere <laughs> else and just take pictures of them. Uh, but no, it's pretty crazy that these guys catch fish at, at Santa Fe Dam as well. Um but yeah, let's go ahead and, and throw up let's throw let's throw up top five really quick, Dom. Uh so Dom took the win with uh 92 and a half, solid bag. Uh Michael Leones had 92 inches, so it was a pretty tight race to the top. And then it pretty much just dropped off after that. And we had Joey uh Aquino caught 78 and three quarters. Pete Garcia caught 72 and a half. And then if Efren Vasquez caught 69.25. And then I don't know if you guys noticed, but Michael caught a 23.75. And we'll go ahead and throw that up there. Um, this it's a giant 23 and three quarters. Absolute tank. Uh, the lagoon is famous for big fish. It's Butch's, Butch Brown's playground. So Dom, you fish this place a lot and um it was cool to see you you know all the time you put into it you know it shows and you went out there and won this event i believe there was a third there's 33 anglers out there um so go ahead and walk us through you know how you took it dude sweet yeah so i i go to this lake pretty often like you said and the fish behave differently at this water they school up and you'll never know like you, you never know if you'll catch a three and a half pounder or a seven pounder or a 10 pounder. That's the thing. They all school up together. Uh, I remember during the winter times I fished for two hours and I stuck 22 fish in those two hours. Almost, almost every other cast, every three casts. Um, so I actually went fun fishing, I believe three or four days before the tournament. And I was just scanning around the lake. What I do a lot of the times is I turn on my live scope, set it to whatever depth that I'm targeting. And I'll literally zigzag the whole entire lake trying to find bait. And I'll set it to 150 feet and I'll set the gain up to like 70%. And I'll literally zigzag open water, zigzag about 50 yards offshore and just find that key bait because we are at the shad spawn right now and post spawn. And as soon as I find that bait, I stop and then I start searching for schools of bass and then I'll rotate my transducer to figure out if there's bass feeding on that bait ball. Um, just 10 yards off of that bait ball, I found schools of bass. They sort of like congregate like crappie. Uh, so, but these were bigger marks. So I took my heavier underspin to get it down about 20 feet of water. And they're going up and down, up and down, just chasing bait to the surface and chasing bait down to the bottom. And uh, my first fish was like a four and a half. And I was just like, holy crap. There was like 10 or 20 of them inside of that school. Was that your 19? Uh, no, no. This was during practice. Oh, okay. And then I uh, found another found another group of fish cast it out there and then stuck a seven during practice so i stuck a seven four and a half and a whole bunch of three and a half so then i was just like okay well i guess i'm gonna try this out during the tournament so tournament day um got the boat ready 6 30 a.m on the water i could launch so open launch format at 6 30 or as soon as you get on the water and then lines in at 7 a.m so I had 30 minutes to scan the whole entire lake. It was slick, calm, bluebird skies. Didn't see any bait in the same spot. So I decided to go check out shallow. Didn't see any fish. I saw some roamers shallow. I saw some bedfish shallow. And I was just like, I'm not feeling this. Two or three hours in, I haven't caught a fish. And I'm just like, 
And mind oh, well, you, these these events lines out is when? Uh, twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Okay. Yeah, so you only have five and a half hours to fish. Yeah. Um. So I went back after two and a half, three hours of finding no fish shallow or, you know, not getting on a bite. So I went back to those bait balls that I didn't find the morning of, found them, and then I saw a school busting on bait, and I was just like, well. I guess I'll just sit here until conditions, you know, pan out. So as soon as like, so I caught two fish on the schools. And so they would go into the bait. They would start chasing shad. And if you rotate your transducer, you'll see which side they're coming in from. They're either coming in from the right side, from the top to the bottom. They'll either push down the bait to the bottom or push, push up bait to the surface. At that time, when it was slick, calm, they were pushing it sideways. So I would catch one. I think my first fish was like 18 or 18.75. I had to kind of let that school of bass relax and then come back to that bait ball. So I would catch one off of the bait ball, leave for 15 minutes and find another bait ball, come back, and then I would catch another bass. And then so I had about three or four fish and it was like 12, it was like 12 p.m. And overcast pulled up. It was partly cloudy and there was a ripple on the surface. And then I'm looking at my live scope and then I saw all of a sudden I look up and I see bash thrashing like striper, just boiling. And I see one bass hit a shad up in the air and the shad went tumbling, tumbling down on the surface. And I see another bass eating it. And I was just like, <laughs> oh my gosh. I had my buddy Leo in the back of me in an aluminum boat in the tournament also. And I was like, Leo, come over here, man. They're schooling up. They're schooling up, dude. It's like yellowtail or something. I take my underspin, zing it out there 120 feet. I turn on my trolling motor 100%. And then I, right when I got to 100 feet, I turned it off and it glided in perfectly. Casted it out with my DC reel. Boom. Get hit like three times. And then finally hook went on an 18 and a quarter, I believe. And that put me around like 90 inches. And then with 20 minutes to go, I see the leader come, come by me with the 23 inch bass. He comes by me and he's heading in. He called it a day. And, that, and then uh, there's fish busting right in front of me. And I had 90 inches. I had 2.5 inches to go or 2.25 inches to go. And uh, took a cast over boiling bass, caught an 18.75 with 20 minutes to go to, to get a lead by half an inch. As I saw the leader go back to the launch ramp, calling it a day. So I was like. You're like, never give know, up. Was, yeah, like, exactly. Mike I can just times. like, never give up. And, and that's that's like one of the most important lessons fishing with you guys is that you know, you guys grind until lines out. You guys don't stop fishing, you know. And I'm pretty sure Brian's the same way. Like, oh yeah, you never stop grinding. You yeah, know, I mean, the more casts you make, you know, the longer your lines in the water. I mean, you got to even think about travel yep. time if you want to go to a different spot. I mean, you're going what 4.5 miles an hour, maybe. Yeah. So you burning burning a lot of casts going spot to spot. So. Yeah. So let's look at your big one. This is a 19, I think, right? 19. Mm -hmm. I think this looks mean. Looks like a shatting machine. Yeah, for sure. Look at, that, look at that mean mug face, dude. He just, he's, he's pissed. He's on that board, bro. You pissed him off. <laughs> look at the, look at those freaking flared out top fins and just freaking. That dude's look a at all that bro. fishing line, man. Look at all that fishing line and that jug of water and those. I bet that's worms. a male, dude. I bet that's a male, dude. Huh, Brian? I don't know. Look at those crocs, bro. I like how the crocs match the, the boat. I can't even tell where your crocs are. <laughs> do you have do you have croc nuts on those? <laughs> <laughs> what are croc nuts? They're testicles for your crotch. <laughs> um, dude, look them up. I gotta ask you a question, okay? Since this picture's up, since this picture's up, 
I'm gonna you, Amazon some croc nuts, right? Now. Hey, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't mind like that mess. Like you, you, you it's, I feel like every time I watch your video and stuff, oh, you always yeah. got a lot. You got a lot going on, bro. You don't ever think about cleaning it up a little bit. <laughs> like, look at the difference between this and like my homie Brian, just like organized, clean. Is that socks? Yeah. Brian, yeah, socks. On, man. You got to get some Crocs matching no. camouflage Let's Crocs, Let's see Mark. Bro. Look at Mark, bro. Mark is just like... That's clean, bon appetit, bro. bro. You could eat off his floor, dude. That's clean. No wonder he caught that big fish, bro. That big fish wanted to be on there, dude. That big fish has like a sore on his lip. <laughs> Dude, sometimes I watch your videos, bro. You got like your, you got like an extra rod like hanging on the left side of your boat, like right in your feet. Like that doesn't bug you. The thing is, is when I'm like zigzagging in open water, You're like they either the, the, exactly. It's like it's like a bass boat deck. I want like three of my main rods on my side at all times, and I don't want to be able to. I don't want to reach back, take it out, and blah blah. blah. I just want to pick it up cast it out because i have fish that are either suspending from a foot to five feet off the bottom or like 20 feet off the bottom so it's like i'll either pick my swim bait up or i'll pick up my drop shot or jig up and then i'll just i'll just fish on you know what i mean but yeah, yeah i mean it it does get messy but dude if you're on a school of bass and you know you don't have things to reach right away and dude they I'm telling you, when I was on these schools of bass, they would move. Well, let me give you a better example. Over at El Cap, I would follow a school of shad, the same ball, for 100 to 200 yards down a bank. And I could see it all happen. It's like a highway or a street where this ba bass lives in this house. And the, and the next, next block over, the other bass lives over at that house. And they would just feed on that same bait ball of shad a hundred to two hundred yards out. And I would just keep on following that shad ball all the way down the bank. And if you don't have all your equipment ready to go, if you don't have everything ready to go, then it's hard. And it's hard to it's hard to not like keep up with these shad when they're biting so well. Yeah. So let's kind of transition into next year. Um the first thing I'm going to let you guys know is that the ABA is considering no live scope for next year. What do you guys think about that? I back that? it. I back it 100%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Damn, then you, all, you better be. Brian's about it. Brian's about it, huh? I'm all for it. I don't Dom, know. are you for it? Um. Uh... I don't know. As long as as long as the tournament schedules over at shallow water only or something like that. But we live in SoCal. Come on, guys. We live in deep water reservoirs. Two D two D only. Two <laughs> <laughs> D so, only. No side scan. No, no down just, scan. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so technology is changing and it's apparent and it's it's helping guys it's it's definitely increasing guys's knowledge of the water um but seriously let's talk about next season so you guys have fished three events so far with the iron man um mm -hmm. what is your guys's takeaways what do you what would you guys like to see maybe next year um brian you can go ahead and go first um i've had fun so far uh, i like the two-day format it it makes you makes you appreciate every fish more i guess you know the first day every fish counts for sure so um i like that it's spread out um i mean they're not scheduled too close together uh there's norcal there's socal um kind of changes it up you know from fishing the same places over and over again yeah um i don't know anything that you good. anything that you maybe you want next year that we don't but it's not in place this year or anything you can think of i think it should i think it should be one pre-fish day instead of two okay fair enough because um, i mean i i know it's hard enough for people to get an extra day off work to you know fish one day yeah but to fish two days 
you know, I, not many people can do that probably. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you on that. Um, Dom, what are you, what are your takes on it? Uh, I don't, I think there should be like a, I like what KBF is doing, you know? Well, first of all, I like those double events where KBF or Bassmaster lands on the same day and winner can take home 10 K, you know, uh, that would be awesome because the higher the payout goes for these tournaments, the better the kayak industry, the better sponsors everybody can get, the better endorsements all these kayakers can get. That's where I really want the field, the sport to go. Um, in terms of like practice days, I like the two day practice, um, but maybe like having a division of like a trail series and a pro series event would be would be pretty pretty awesome or like a pro and amateur or something um i don't know um i i love the two-day format i believe that it does take a skill another skill um another cylinder in order to win like these two-day events like period but i mean one day two day of practice it, it doesn't actually it doesn't really matter to me one or two days. I do like the the blackout dates though. The two day the two weeks of like no one could touch the water. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that too. Especially, you know, we have a lot of guys traveling and we travel yeah. up north and stuff like that. So one thing that um I don't know if we lost Brian or not. It looks like we lost him. There he goes. Come back in. Um you you good, Brian? Yep. I just, yeah. I just got one one yeah. thing one thing that I'm kind of thinking like next season is that uh we do maybe two in SoCal, two in NorCal, and then we do let's just say two in Arizona, and then we do two one in like Utah, one in like uh Colorado area. Mm-hmm. And we don't, you know, if you want to go to all of them, you can. Um, it'll still, it'll, it'll probably be your best three or something like that. Basically, taking the Working Man, the Iron Man series, and like meshing them and like making it like one big West Coast region event, and then having a championship somewhere, you know, that is, I don't, I don't even know where we're having it this year, but like having a championship, a big championship. Um, I think it'll, it'll, it'll dr- bring more anglers in from the regions to fish, you know, mm-hmm. their local region. And then if they want to travel, they can, and it'll be the same payout, same blackout period. Um, it'll be worth everyone's travel time, but that's kind of something that it's not for sure. It's not going to happen We we haven't even really talked about it, to be honest. That's more just like my own thought on maybe for next season. Um, because, you know, having all the events in California aren't, you know, that, uh, what do you want to call it? That a pleasing our West Coast guys that are still West Coast. West Coast doesn't mean California. West Coast is literally like Arizona, Nevada, Utah, all those guys. So um, it just kind of opens up more opportunity for those anglers as well. And then if we want to travel, we could we could travel to those events and it'll be worth our time and worth the travel to go because the payouts will be big and that's the one thing i really like like we're fishing against 40 anglers and we're 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 possibly bringing home like what like almost three thousand dollars each time if we if you win and we're only facing 40 guys you know granted those 40 anglers are really top sticks in in our in our sport but it just makes it a little bit more like you said don like it, it it already is kind of like its own little pro event i guess you can call it I mean, if you look at all the names that are fishing these events, like it's it's pretty much like the top six in California, like and all across the whole Western region. Um, but I think putting it in everyone's backyard will also encourage the guys that maybe don't want to travel to California every single time. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I like the idea. Sort of I actually like the idea having three events close to each region. So I have maybe three events over at NorCal, three events over in Arizona, three again events 
in SoCal and et cetera. So that way, at least you have three shots of it, three shots at angler of the year or, or qualifying for the championship in yeah, your local I mean, the region. whole goal, the whole goal for like this year is to, that's how we did. That's how we did our best three kind of this year, but we're trying to encourage mm-hmm. people to travel and fish, like to travel and fish against each yeah. other. Like that's the whole kind of goal behind it is to get guys to travel. And, and that's why, we did our best three out of six this year. So that way, you know, it's encouraging to travel to get more events in because you only take your best three. Right. So if we could get like something like what KBF is doing, then I would travel a lot more. If we could get like a trail trail series going and a pro series, leave the, leave our $250 buy-in for ABA happening right now. Leave that, leave that alone. And then just have an individual day for each event too. Like a hundred dollars, hundred fifteen dollars for Saturday, hundred fifteen for Sunday. I think you would get a lot of a lot more participants that can only fish one day as well. Yeah. So like well, all think, those. I guys, think doing like a one day, like mm-hmm. a one day separate series, like completely separate, like, and yeah. maybe maybe just in SoCal. I don't know, or have a couple events in NorCal too, but just kind of scaling it down and because the working man's series was gonna be that but Mm -hmm. they just couldn't do it in time to like effectively do it where you know they came out so late that to throw throw an event in to the crazy schedule that's already out there Mm -hmm. so i don't know next year kind of going back to the drawing board i think iron man might stay pretty consistent but i think uh working man might change a little bit i don't know i mean we, I don't have no idea. That would be awesome. Kind of it out there, but yeah, because I I do want to start seeing more more of the SoCal kayak anglers come come in and have a chance at it. Like one of yeah. like the people that can only fish one day. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think uh, I'm kind of biased for San Vicente because I took the pro series, but I like that there are some anglers that could participate that I don't normally see on the trail events too. Yeah. Um, and then there's and then there's your go hard pro pro guys that are fishing in overall two days, like Brian Lepke, Shane Lamont, Dominic, Anthony Garcia. All those guys are fishing those two day events, right? But then it's also nice to see those guys that can participate for one day and just pick it, you know? Yeah. That's why it's. I mean, that's why it's important to continue to promote and continue to support the the local clubs, whether it's SoCal urban anglers, Yakabass, um, mm-hmm. to keep those alive and going. Cause it gives those anglers that can't do two days or just want to go out and have fun and compete for a, you know, a lower entry fee. And then that's, that's what those are designed for. And, um, exactly. the ABA is a business wild west, is a business, uh, bass mm-hmm. is a business. KBF is a business. So at the end of the day, they're a business and they need to make money. And that's just the bottom line. So yeah, they're going to try to provide opportunities, but they also need to make a buck. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the local clubs don't really have that pressure to, to make money. They just do it to, you know, create opportunity for guys. So mm-hmm. uh, it's just all what makes sense business wise for these bigger, you know, circuits, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens for next season. I know Brian yeah. keeps going in and out. So <laughs> <laughs> Brian, come on, stop logging onto your Amazon <laughs> trying to buy those crock nuts. <laughs> you have enough, Brian. <laughs> well, we're kind of hitting that hour mark right now. So, Dom, uh, what's next for you? You're just going to hit Otai now and just kind of take a little breather on the tournaments? I'm going to New York City. Welcome, with my welcome back. Welcome back, Brian. <laughs> welcome back, Brian. Uh, going to New York City, Brooklyn to go visit my sister this coming up week. I came. With my I came back to leave again. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian. I'll see you later. It's nice chatting joking. with you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Was, on. Oh. I think he was joking. Oh, he was joking. Okay, <laughs> wait. <laughs> Is he joking or not joking? Yet? No. Yeah, Brian. I do you have to go. Oh, you have oh, to go. Okay. okay. All right, Brian. Brian, uh, you're the man, dude. Keep it up, and uh, we'll have you on again soon. I'm sure. You need me for anything else? No, we're we're gonna wrap. We're wrapping it up right now. So, if there's anyone you want to thank, you can hey, shout you them out. Hey, did you say you don't know where the champion? You say you don't know where the championship is? 
I don't know where the championship is yet. Nope. <laughs> Brian wants to oh, practice. <laughs> Huntington Harbor? <laughs> no. <laughs> Newport Harbor? No. <laughs> All right. Hawaii. Later. Hawaii. <laughs> All right. See ya. All right, Brian. See you later. <laughs> he was having some Wi Fi troubles. <laughs> So yeah, uh, uh, going to New York City, Brooklyn, go visit my sister with my girlfriend. I'm gonna have an actual true holiday, just like Shane does every every week. Yeah, I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> just have some family time, and then um, I was I was thinking about doing Pine View KBF, but probably not. I have to work. I have to work, work, work. So probably KBF monthly, and then lower Otai, like you said, KBF lower Otai and ABA. Lower Otai. Well, and that's then a nice we have thing that we, got, that we got lower Otai coming up because, I mean, both of us, we just need like one top 10 and we're good, bro. Yeah. Just one top yeah, 10 yeah. out of both the days and we can go to the NC with hope. Well, let's <laughs> get it, dude. Top three, man. Top yeah. three, Sh- Shane and I, man. Let's call it right because now. It, at the end of the day, well, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the NC finish, your trail. Well, actually, it's your trail series championship finish. Did you know that? So it's not your yeah. NC finish; it's the Trail Series Championship finish that right. matters the most. So, the, um, I believe the the NC is more of like for every participant, not just. Pro, well, no, I'm just saying for members. Angler of the Year, for your Angler of the Year yeah. points, the Trail Series Championship is the final points. So there, so that right. two day championship will be what's decided, you know, and it's points and a half too. So that's on, you know, if we just hate, if we just have top 10, like everyone that has top 10 in KBF trail points has a shot. If you take top 10 in the trail championship, you know what I mean? Like it just depends on how well you do there. So, so if all five guys that go to the West coast or more, if they all finish in the top 10, you'll see all top 10 West coast guys go to the 10 house. There could be a few uh, West coast guys this year. That's for sure. I, Tim O'Connor like said he was going to go out there, right? Tim O'Connor. I, mean, I hope. My possibility. I hope. I hope as many people as they as we as we have can go. But yeah, uh, we'll we'll see what happens, dude. I think Otai is going to be fun. It's going to be a good time, uh, no matter what. And uh, I'm looking forward to yeah. it. I'm going to take a little break again, and uh, spend the time with family, and then head to Otai with some confidence. But the interesting thing about Otai for me is that I'm going to be in a wedding on Friday night. (laughs) My brother-in-law is getting married on Friday night. Luckily, it's just it's right here locally in Corona. So Friday night, right after the wedding, I'm just going to basically drive to the lake and sleep in my truck and go. You should you should vlog that portion and add it to your video of the wedding. Kind of like, yeah, the night before, just have like a 10 second clip and just be like, Yo guys, I'm at the wedding. I can practice blah 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 or such, and then just add yeah. that in the beginning or something like that. And well, I the practice still is won. The practice is Wednesday, so I might head oh, down there Wednesday. Yeah, I might head down there Wednesday. Well, it adds to the story, you know what yeah. I mean? Uh-huh. Like hungover and won the KBF lower O. Well, if I drive event. to the lake right after the wedding, I'm not gonna be able to drink that much at all. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah. Adding that little story that people admire that, you know? Yep. That's great. All right, Dom. Well, let's go ahead and just wrap it up. Uh, you can thank whoever you want to thank. This is like your third time on the show, I think, or second. So go ahead and just take uh, it away. And send us okay. home. Okay. All right. Thanks to my family and friends. Thanks, Mortar Guy. Thanks, Wu Tungsten. And I just want to quickly shout out Nathan. Uh, He's battling leukemia over on the East Coast, and I donated. I just found out from Bass Fishing Addicts, and uh, yeah, he's battling leukemia. So let's give like prayers to him. Hope he does well, you know, and survive this and battle battle leukemia. And then also um, Riley, Riley from Urban Angler Club. He is suffering from MS and now is in a wheelchair, but still fishing these events. So like shout out to Riley too. You guys are true inspiration to the, to the sport. And uh, yeah, just, just grateful for what I have now. And um, 
and yeah, that's all. That's all I want to leave at. Leave it at. Sweet man. Well, guys, that's gonna do it for tonight's episode. Uh, if you guys want to follow Brian Lefke, go ahead and search him on Instagram. Follow Dom Double Digit Angler on YouTube and Instagram. Follow myself, Bass Thumbs Fishing. Uh, till next time, guys. Uh, keep your thumbs ripped, and we'll uh, see you guys on the next one. See ya. Peace.